Oh, wait, you're listening. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. <coughs> you're listening, listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. From WNYC. See? Yep. Hey, this is Pat Walters uh, coming at you today with the final episode of our Radio Lab mini series on intelligence, G. And so for this last episode, we wanted to shift the mood a little bit. Because as we were putting this series together, we did lots of stories on human intelligence, but we also found ourselves thinking about intelligence in other animals. And so to get into that, we decided to host an event all about animal intelligence. And today, we're going to share that event with you. Just a quick warning, uh, there are some curse words uh, in the show, so bear that in mind. So, and the reason that we're doing this is because a couple of months ago, I ended up on the phone with a science writer I really love named Dan Engber. And Dan went on a rant about how messed up it is that we only seem able to talk about animal intelligence in terms of our own intelligence. Uh, He said... So much of animal intelligence research uh, is built on making animals do stuff that we feel like humans would be good at doing, uh, instead of considering their intelligence on their own terms. And so tonight, uh, we decided we would do an episode about animal intelligence that shifts the focus from us to them, that considers their unique abilities uh, on their own terms, uh, and in doing so, uh, hopefully might help us redefine a little bit what we think about intelligence uh, in general for all of us. And because we're humans and we like contests, we decided we'd make it a competition. (laughs) Um, So here's how it'll work. We have four contestants who will engage in a series of head-to-head bouts to convince a panel of judges that their animal is the smartest. Uh, I'm going to bring up our first pair of contestants in a moment. But uh, first, let's meet our judges. Uh, Oh, a little music. Nice. Okay. Uh, So first, please welcome, uh, these two guys have done hundreds of stories about all kinds of smart animals. Uh, Please welcome the co-hosts of Radio Lab, Jad Abramrod and Robert Krolwich. Kind of had to use the guys, the obvious choices, but we also invited one more surprise judge. The real star of our judging panel. From humble beginnings in a shelter in Oklahoma City, she's risen to the highest levels of success in show business in New York. Her television credits include High Maintenance and The Leftovers, and she has appeared in more productions of the Broadway play Annie in the role of Sandy than any other actor. Like any great star, she goes by only one name. Please welcome Macy. Macy is a dog. It's about 35 pounds, has that scruffy brown fur. She trotted right on the stage and uh, hopped onto a chair next to Jad Robert. Okay, so before we start, I just want to ask the judges here one question to kind of set the terms and make sure we all know what we're looking for. Uh, I want you guys to just define intelligence in you know two or three sentences. Uh, how would you define what you're looking for in the contestants' uh, stories tonight? Robert, why don't you start? Animal intelligence. Animal intelligence. Animal intelligence. Well, I would say that a very smart animal should be asked, how well do you understand your world? Knowing that some are sniffers and some are tasters and some are good flyers and so on. But really, when you see a fox on a snowy day jump into a pound of snow and somehow land right on the little mouse that's two feet down, I think that's a smart, smart animal. Jen? Uh, I think what I'm going to pay attention to uh, are arguments on behalf of creatures where you see the creatures encounter some kind of obstacle and then problem solve their way around it. Mm-hmm. So creatures that are flexible, can adapt very quickly. Yeah. And, um, and I'm going to give a special nod, I think, to creatures that show collective intelligence or like moral intelligence, if mm-hmm. that's even a thing. Okay. So that's what I'm going to be paying attention to. Okay, good. Macy? Uh, what do you think? How, how would you define intelligence, Macy? <laughs> She's just repeating Jad, really. It's just kind of <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So once we had our judges set, we brought our contestants onto the stage. 
And the way it worked is they each had four minutes to make the case for why they thought their animal was the smartest of them all. And at the end of each round, the judges would vote, and we'd bring out the next two contestants. Y'all ready to meet our contestants? Okay. Good. Okay, so first up, we have Tracy Clayton and Jordan Mendoza. Tracy Clayton hosts the hit podcast Another Round, and more recently, the podcast Strong Black Legends. Sir. Uh, (laughs) ma'am. And Jordan Mendoza is a comedian, a writer for Comedy Central, and uh, hosts a live science and comedy show uh, in Brooklyn called Drunk Science. Okay, so, uh, Tracy, what uh, what animal did you bring for this first entry? Um... The smartest animal in the world, hands down, is the crow. Boo! <laughs> wow! Okay. Okay. okay, okay, so we have the crow. I was just kidding. I don't really, no. <laughs> They're fine, yeah. No, he meant that. This is war now. This is the fight. We're fighting. We're fighting. Hey, Jordan, what, what's your entry for this round? Uh, a s- slime mold. Uh, so, first round, animal. crow versus slime mold. We're going to start with Tracy. Ready? Okay. Go. So... If you don't know how amazing crows are, it's not your fault. It's because the media is racist and they've told you how to feel about crows. For example, (laughs) the most famous crows in the world are these. Here you got the dumbs, the dumbs, the crows from Dumbo. (laughs) They're dressed like street pimps. Five crows They're wearing brightly colored hats, one of them smoking a cigar. No jobs, shiftless, lazy, black, coincidence, I'm sure. And then here, uh, this is a, a <laughs> this is Jim Crow. If you don't know about Google, you got to do a Google. Oh. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't know, we don't have enough time. So um, here's why crows are the best and the smartest. Number one, they are extremely resourceful. Have you all heard of this dude named Aesop? He wrote some fables. <laughs> One of them was about a crow who had to get like a treat or something out of like a pitcher or something. And so what he did was he dropped stones into the pitcher so the water level would raise, got what he wanted. Guess what? Crows really do that for real in real life. Uh, then Tracy showed a video of a crow and a half empty glass of water. And the crow kept adding stones into the glass until the water was at the rim and the crow could get a treat. Uh, most of my exes cannot do this. (laughs) Crows can solve problems, puzzles, with as many as eight steps. Definitely none of my exes could do that. Point number dos. Um, crows can be taught to talk. Right? The surprise gasps. To talk what? To talk. Crow or to talk? To say human English words or human words, human languages. Um, Crows are songbirds, y'all. So are ravens. But you don't know that because they're not parrots. They're not brightly colored. They're black. Again, (laughs) racist. Just because they don't sing the same way the parrots do, you know, it's not, it doesn't count. But their vocalization skills are really, really, really good. When you get a chance, Google Talking Crow and you'll find some, some videos. I think we have one. Mm-hmm. Hello. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> there it is. Yep, yep, exactly. That's exactly. a real crow video? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. an actual crow. Yeah. Crows can talk as can ravens. Point number three, B, C, point number C. Crows <laughs> have funerals, right? But they have funerals for good reasons. Not that humans don't have funerals for good reasons. But humans have funerals to make ourselves feel better. Like, oh my God, I miss Big Mama so much. I just need to see her one more time before she goes on to the whatever in the sky. Crows. Also, we still have wakes where we literally sit around and look at a dead body and wait for it to wake up even though we know it's not going to. <laughs> Evolve out of that, please. It's not, it's not time. Here's why crows have funerals, right? So Rashad dies. Bless Rashad. He's just plop. Rashad is the crow. <laughs> so, so the crows are like, oh, can I, what is, what is the cuss word thing? You can say whatever. Say it. Oh, yeah. shit, man, Rashad, what the fuck, bruh, what happened? <laughs> and so all the crows will like congregate around Rashad to see what killed him so they can be like, we need to stay away from whatever Rashad was doing because <laughs> look at Rashad now, you know? <laughs> Point number four is that they can recognize faces for up to five years and they hold grudges. So if you walk past... Uh, it's crows, actually two and a half years. Shit, they just like, nah, don't fuck with this one over here. They tell all their friends, the next time you come around, the crows are going to... Just... <laughs> this motherfucker back. 
Don't trust him. It's amazing. So in conclusion, crows should not be called a murder. They should be called something smarter, like a symposium of crows. <laughs> All right. All right. A really good job. That was great. Jane. That was great. Oh, so, what a supportive enemy. I hate good sports. I'm going to look like an asshole. I think we're all winners here. <laughs> okay, Jordan Mendoza Next up was Jordan Mendoza mold. with the slime mold. Uh, he put up a slide of a Petri dish with this, like, yellow lightning bolty streak going okay. across it. Okay, you're probably wondering, what, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Uh, but guys, don't worry. I freaking looked it up. A slime mold is a brainless, single-celled, pulsating wad of yellow goo. I learned if you put a slime mold in an environment where there is a complex decision to make, for instance, which direction to choose to find a good food source, this superorganism can solve that problem relatively easily by spreading its cytoplasm out, advancing and retreating in response to what, it's, what it finds. So this is a superorganism composed of thousands of nuclei, and they will collectively decide to make a decision for the group. Humans, on the other hand, are not at all good at collectively finding a good food source. <laughs> Have you ever tried to order Seamless with another person? <laughs> not easy. What are we gonna do? Pizza, Korean, Chinese, sushi. My roommate and I always end up choosing diarrhea. <laughs> There are three general types of slime mold. Uh, plasmodial slime molds, cellular slime molds, and Gary Busey. Jordan put up a picture of Gary Busey. If, uh, if you don't know what he looks like, Google him. For those who don't know, the joke here is that Gary Busey looks and is like a slime mold. Um, Plasmodial slime molds are masses of thousands of nuclei that move around by spreading out in a fractal pattern, learning the lay of the land, and even solving mazes and mapping networks with incredible efficiency. How efficient? It took human engineers years to map out a Tokyo rail system. It took a slime mold just hours. Uh, I read that in an article titled, Watch This Slime Mold Dunk on Japanese Engineers. <laughs> Uh, I'm just kidding. I made that article title up. No one, no one wrote that. Um, the second type is a cellular slime mold, and this spends most of its life as a single free-willing amoeba, which sounds like a sitcom that just got greenlit on Fox. This quirky free-wheeling amoeba just got the consulting job of her dreams. But can she balance love, work, and New York City? Check out all the single-celled ladies starring Zoe Deschanel as the slime mold. Then Jordan went on to explain how slime molds look out for each other in this amazing way. When one amoeba runs out of food, something incredible happens. It starts emitting chemical pulses, assembling clusters of other amoeba into a larger superorganism. This is a process called chemotaxis, or if it's trying to save money, chemo uber pool. <laughs> Um, this superorganism then releases spores to find more food and then dies. Chemotaxis shows that slime molds are altruistic beings. They'll sacrifice themselves for the benefit of the species. I, on the other hand, will never die for the benefit of others. I won't even give my subway seat up to an elderly pregnant woman who's carrying a piece of furniture. <laughs> Finally, the last category of slime mold is Gary Busey. <laughs> An Oscar-nominated American actor who has appeared in over 150 films, including Lethal Weapon, The Firm, and Piranha 3DD. In conclusion, slime molds are very smart. Please vote for me because I'm Asian, and if you don't vote for me, that's racist. I did not know we could do that for the record. I had no idea. Wow. Give it up for Jordan Mendoza and the slime mold. Thank you. Okay, uh, judges, do, do, we'll do a couple minutes here. What, what, deliberating, asking questions. What, what, what are your reactions to these two? Wow, crow well, versus like slime mold. Scale, like that, a something so small multiplied so many times could come to complicated and sophisticated conclusions is a pretty impressive accomplishment. Mm -hmm. is Each it? individual. <laughs> No. I don't know. Yeah, it's. I don't know. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I don't know. Pretty cool. <laughs> but but also, I I was leaning in that direction. But just to sort of give uh, the crow a fair shake, uh. if a crow can see a, a person and then remember it and disseminate the for reputation five years. Five again, five years, two and a half years. Year crows, well, that that's some kind of crow 
language or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, mm -hmm. well, very impressive. Macy, I, you have a crow feeling one way or the other? <laughs> she does. Crow? That's <laughs> yeah. What's she well, saying? Well, she's saying that she's not sure that she knows that many um, molds. Okay. Um, <laughs> Oklahoma City is a sort of dry town, and they don't have a forest there. So she feels a little bit um, unequal to the challenge here. What with the unfamiliar... Oh, well, she did study them once. Do you speak dog, Robert? I, I, I understand that I can't speak it. I see. <laughs> yeah. But... Okay, but well, she, is, she is partial to Gary Busey, which uh, okay. has, uh, has confused her. her well, let's, let's, let's vote. Why don't we go down the line? Chad, wh wh what do you choose? Gosh, I think just on... I think I'm going to have to go with the, the slime mold. Ooh, wow. wow. After giving it up for crows. Okay, so Chad, slime mold, Robert? I, I'm going to... You know, with great respect for crows that hate well, I, I agree. Uh, they, they can, but I'm, I'm going to go with the slime mold as well. Okay. And Macy. Macy? Sound like crow Oh, my God. <laughs> What do we what do we have for Macy? Crow. Crow. So Crow. surprising. Okay. All right. All so right. So surprising for an animal. Despite her love yeah. of Gary Busey, yeah. she voted for Crow. <laughs> okay. So okay. the so judges the voted the in favor round. of the slime mold. The slime and mold. after that, we brought up our next set of contestants to defend a whole new pair of animals. Okay. Let's get our next contestants up here. Laurel Breitman and Dan Engber. Give it up, everybody. Dan Engber is a writer for Slate and the New York Times Magazine. And Laurel Breitman is the author of the best-selling book, Animal Madness, and a teacher at Stanford. Okay. Laurel, what uh, animal are you entering into the mix? Sperm whales. Sperm whale. Sperm okay. Whale. Okay, good. And Dan, what will you be bringing to the table? The chicken. Uh. The chicken. Okay. <laughs> the Zero contest. Oh, I am so, so, I am so interested in how this is going to play out. <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll start with Laurel. Take it away. Sperm whales are huge, the biggest tooth whales, but in a lot of ways, uh, they're like us. They have big brains and really complex social lives, but unlike us, they live in a matriarchal culture. <laughs> they probably even have stronger social and emotional bonds than we do. Young males go off on their own to find a new pod, and then everyone else stays together for the life. Sperm whales communicate a lot like us, too, physically and with language. But they also have a third way, and I think we should consider it like a sixth sense. Maybe you think about echolocation like boat sonar, like a ping goes out, and then it bounces, or the sound bounces off a thing in their environment, and then it comes back um, and giving, gives the boat like a grainy shape of whatever that object is. And dolphin and whale sonar does this too, and so do bats. But animal sonar also comes back as a physical feeling. In the case of sperm whales, it's really loud too. They make the loudest sounds of any animal on earth, up to 230 decibels. Whoa. I know. It's actually, it's louder than standing next to a jet engine at takeoff. Our eardrums can rupture at 150 decibels, which is basically like a gun going off next to your head. Sperm whales make these click, creaking, and buzzing sounds in their nasal passages, and then they amplify and direct them with this big, fatty, waxy organ in their foreheads um, called the melon, and it's like, <laughs> I know, it's a terrible word. They probably have another word for it um, <laughs> that's better, uh, but it's like a huge built-in megaphone in their head. just like that, but way louder, like crazy loud, so loud that it would hurt us to be listening to it. And this echolocation is so powerful that it, they can track a squid up to a mile away. And their social messages <laughs> probably travel just as far. So knowing what we know of their really complex social lives, their sixth sense likely comes with its own emotional experiences too. But we can't name those because we don't know what those feelings are like. So. I want you to try to imagine it, though. What would it be like to be like reading a book 
while suddenly finding out, just by feeling it, that your ex-girlfriend is coming around the corner of an underwater shelf a half a mile away. <laughs> now, she broke up with you. <laughs> Matriarchal culture. You've been so lonely, but now you know the signal is meant for you just because of how it feels when you pick it up. And not only that, but you have an immediate, accurate picture of exactly what she looks like. Not just the shape of her, but the perfect curve of her jaw, her sexy 12-inch layer of blubber <laughs> that you've missed so much. But also, you can also immediately tell how much she cares about you, too, and that's why she's coming back. Also, you've been hunting a giant squid this whole time. <laughs> so sperm whales might have a particular emotion that goes along with experiences like these. And they maybe even have a different sense of self. In the mid-1980s, a neuropsychologist named Harry Jarrison proposed that echolocated communications that are emotional in nature, so like grief or joy, might be experienced by whales and dolphins as more than shared information. They actually might come in as shared feelings, shared emotional experiences. Jarrison thought that this might give rise to something called the communal self, meaning that whales and dolphins might not say, I, they might always be a we. We are sad, we are sick. And there's some evidence for this. So like in whale strandings, for example, when a bunch of whales will come up to the shore and strand themselves and die. But when we actually do studies on the whales, we find out that maybe only one or two in a hundred was actually sick. Something is going on here. And I think it may be we sick. Um, wow. So I don't want to end on that super sad note, guys. Uh, it also might be why I'm whales sad. and... <laughs> I know, I know. I'm going to lose just because it's sad. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you one really nice thing and then we're going to turn it over to the mystery, mystery animal over here. Uh, it also might be why dolphins and whales, there's so many reports of them coming to the aid of swimmers who are struggling <laughs> or fending off sharks from somebody who really needs protection or help or even doing things like this, which I love. This is a case of sperm whales who adopted a deformed dolphin. So a dolphin with a spinal abnormality who they welcomed into their pod. So sperm whales, man. Uh, what looks like extreme empathy to us might just them be being themselves, or maybe it's a new kind of intelligence, one that requires a kind of communal feeling as opposed to thoughts about other people's feelings. So, thank you. All right, then. Sperm whale. Well done. Okay. Well done. Very good. All right. Oh. Next up, Dan Engber. <laughs> chickens. With the chickens. <laughs> Let me start with this. A chicken can beat a human in tic-tac-toe. A chicken almost always beats a human in tic-tac-toe. I learned this fact in high school when my friend Rob got obsessed with one particular tic-tac-toe playing chicken named Willie, who lived at the video arcade at Mott Street. And Willie beat Rob over and over and over again at tic-tac-toe. Willie wasn't unique. Birds like him were once a pretty common carnival attraction. Their popularity peaked in the early 80s when trained chickens were shipped around the country, rented out for $200 a day, or sold for several thousand dollars each. And these chickens were so good at tic-tac-toe that humans were getting demoralized. <laughs> at least one distributor started having the birds lose on purpose every fifth game to make it seem more fair. Now, it turned out this whole thing had started years earlier in the South at a place called the IQ Zoo in Hot Springs, Arkansas. There, a pair of scientists, Marion and Keller Breland, had built a business out of training up strange animal behaviors. Their zoo was like a product showroom, a place to demo the ducks they'd taught to play piano, or rabbits that drove around in little fire trucks, or hamsters on trapeze. <laughs> but the Breland's... <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be that smart to go on trapeze. The Breland's most popular and enduring act was the bird brain, a chicken in a box which disappeared behind a screen to peck O's onto a game board. Chinatown Willie was one of those, or maybe someone else's knockoff. In any case, I watched that chicken play a lot of tic-tac-toe. 
peering over Rob's shoulder, I tried to figure out the chicken's secret strategy. But then, last week, really last week, I discovered that all those observations were for naught. As I got ready for tonight's talk, I stumbled across a copy of an old instruction manual, which the Breelands would send out with their bird brain units. And according to that manual, the chicken in the box wasn't really playing tic-tac-toe at all. In fact, behind the screen, there was nothing but a single light bulb and a switch. When the light went on, the chicken pecked, and an O appeared somewhere on the board in the spot chosen by computer. I found this kind of devastating. <laughs> Partly because I'd promised Pat a talk on the intelligence of chickens. <laughs> but here's the reality. Chickens are kind of dumb. <laughs> As we've seen, they're even dumb compared to other birds. They don't have funerals, you know, they're not, uh, or make tools like crows. Uh, they don't learn to speak like parrots. In fact, if a chicken has any special talent at all, it's that when you chop off its head, it can go on acting like a chicken <laughs> for days or weeks or even months. <laughs> but still, I think there's something amazing about Willie and the other bird brains. It's not that these chickens were smart enough to beat us at tic-tac-toe, because they weren't. It's that we humans were dumb enough to lose. <laughs> I mean, tic-tac-toe is not a complicated game, actually. If you can think ahead just a bit, you ought to be able to play any round of tic-tac-toe to a draw, even against a computer. And yet, it seems we humans can't or won't succeed even at this very modest test of our intelligence. And I think that's useful to remember, especially tonight, because this whole project to rank species according to their smarts takes it as a given that a gulf exists between the very dumbest and the very smartest animals, that the chicken and the chimpanzee or the sperm whale or the crow live on separate continents of cognition. But I call that vanity. That's what Willie taught us, that there we were standing in the same arcade, befuddled by the same computer, each unable to succeed at the same simple game. We were joined together across several hundred million years of evolution by what we couldn't do. Judges, a vote for chicken is a vote for finding that common ground. <laughs> it's a vote for unity and kinship. A vote for chickens is a vote for all of us. Thank you. Dan Engmer with the chicken. <laughs> Okay. Wow. This is so. Yeah. I, this is where do dumb you go together, with that? Dumb together, our heart felt together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Continuum. Wow. Why? What? I, what? I. I don't even know. What do? You, what are you? Which way are you leaning? Well, I, I did not know that stuff about the sperm whales no. at all. I. I should. Rec I actually played on Mott Street with the Chinatown chicken in the 1980s, so I <laughs> probably should not and lost. But, of course. <laughs> So, you know, I don't know whether the other judge is awake, but... At this point, Macy had uh, curled up into a ball, kind of taking a back seat on judging. I, this is like the Meryl Streepification. I mean, if we were better humans, we would have the kind of antenna and radar that a great actress would have, where you can just somehow project and return. You go to a movie like with her, and you go, you know, every move she makes, like, touches you. Oh, I can't, I can't. I am enthralled by this. What, what you saying? Doesn't like Streep. <laughs> what? Oh, because he's she's a Broadway star uh, herself. Oh, oh. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what, what about? She's feeling Streep right now. Can I can I ask a fussy question about the about sperm whale? Is uh, of isn't all emotion somehow, it's, it's a physical. Physical, physical, right? Yeah, we have a limited so, system, too. So is it a question of degrees, that, that somehow they are experiencing that in much or is it an entirely different kind of intelligence, would you think? I think that they have another way of accessing their emotional life than we do. So they have everything we have, right? Like their friend can go up and clap them on the back or give them a 
sperm whale hug or whatever, right? Like they still have that and they also have language, but then they have this other thing, which I, to me, just because I avoid my inbox and whatever, it feels like some form of email, right? Mm -hmm. Like you send it at a great distance, but it's emotional and you pick it up with your face. <laughs> I, you know what? Wow. I, I, I think I got it. My heart goes sperm whale. I, as a political platform, I vote chicken. Yeah. But as my heart says, uh, I, I gotta go for political. the sperm whale. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you vote I go sperm, sperm whale, yeah. Jed. I go sperm. Sperm whale too. <laughs> sperm too. That's three, a sweet. Yeah. Wow, okay, all right. Tough break, Dan. So at this point, the first round was finished. Uh, the judges had weighed in on some pretty compelling cases for the crow, the slime mold, the sperm whale, and the chicken. Next up, we had another round of competition. Same basic idea. We asked each of our four contestants to bring a smart animal to the table to make a case for. But this time, we threw a couple curveballs at them. That and the final crowning of the world's smartest animal after a quick break. This is Nan DeRosa from Amsterdam. Radiolab is supported in part by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, enhancing public understanding of science and technology in the modern world. More information about Sloan at www.sloan.org. So in part one of our competition, we heard arguments for the intelligence of the crow, the slime mold, the sperm whale, and the chicken. And in part two, we decided to raise the stakes a little, uh, give our competitors a couple more challenges. Uh, the first challenge is that they are now going to have to compete with their nemesis from the first round. So we're going to team them up, and we're going to have a round, a two-on-two round. And the other challenge we gave them is uh, we noticed that we weren't really paying that much attention to the furry mammals. I think a lot of us imagine that we may be among the smartest animals in, in, the, in the animal kingdom. Uh, some of us won't, yeah. And so, but we decided let's do some furry mammals, but, uh, but the challenge was not to do any of the usual suspects. So no humans, of course, no chimpanzees, no elephants, uh, no dogs. Sorry, Macy. Um, come up with an unexpectedly smart furry mammal uh, with, your, with your new uh, former enemy teammate. So... Uh, First Dan up were Laurel. Dan and Laurel, you, who had uh, absolutely no with, trouble at all it, uh, agreeing on a smart animal? furry mammal. It was obviously the raccoon. It was obviously the raccoon. Why? Uh, OG of the animal kingdom, been showing us how to live in cities for a really long time. Yeah, I'm, I just I, there was no other choice. I don't even. Why are we talking about this? <laughs> no, it's a no-brainer. Um, all right, yeah. take it away. In the fall of 1906. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to win, Dan. <laughs> I know. In the fall of 1906, this headline, Smart Raccoons, was picked up by several major newspapers. The column underneath described a Mr. and Mrs. Golopard, who'd been traveling from town to town in a double-decker covered wagon beneath a family of trained raccoons that worked for them as chimney sweeps. <laughs> It was not the only story of its kind. In those years, raccoons were often touted by reporters for their high intelligence, or their sagacity, or their skill at making mischief. This is the odd and tragic story of how we came to understand briefly, a century ago, that raccoons were among the very shrewdest animals of all, and then we forgot. <laughs> the link between an animal's slipperiness and its smarts was once well established among scientists. At Columbia University, Edward Thorndike had been testing the intelligence of cats and dogs by locking them in boxes. He'd seal the box with latches, bolts, or string pulleys and leave a snack outside as motivation. This was Houdini in the lab, an escape room, but for animals. <laughs> then in 1907, a psychologist in Oklahoma named Lawrence Worcester Cole thought to put raccoons through those same puzzle boxes to learn, as he put it, their proper place in the scale of mammalian intelligence. And he found some amazing things. His raccoons, Tom, Jim, Jack, and Dolly, would at times break free of the puzzle box and then ignore the food reward. It was as if they'd gone through the exercise, not in service of their hunger, as other animals might do, but to satisfy an inner curiosity. 
Cole also found that his raccoons, unlike cats, could learn to escape a given box just by watching humans do it. And based on this and other work, a soft consensus came together in psychology that raccoons were in fact quite high on the scale of mammalian intelligence, much higher than a cat or a dog at any rate, and maybe even on a par with primates. But alas, this whole idea was soon to be challenged and erased. In the same year Cole published his research, the president, Teddy Roosevelt, lashed out against the tendency of nature writers to ascribe human-like abilities to raccoons and other animals. The president, who is an avid outdoorsman, called this fake news. <laughs> Within a few years, some of Cole's most impressive findings with raccoons were challenged by his peers. Even scientists who believed in Cole's research would find it hard to follow up. For one thing, the raccoons they meant to study kept escaping. Mm -hmm. And a new paradigm was spreading through psychology, one that had little time for musings on a raccoon's imagination or its curiosity or its loneliness. In place of Tom and Jim and Jack and Dolly, there were rats, nameless rats. <laughs> so raccoons vanished from the lab, and then, as cities grew, they vanished from our lives out of sight, and for a while, out of mind. Dun, dun, dun. But, <laughs> <laughs> turns out, as people moved out of the country and into the cities, the raccoons followed us. And our urban spaces aren't just the perfect place for raccoons to demonstrate their intelligence, but I argue that they are also making them even smarter. Today, though, the people that know the most about urban raccoons are the people whose job it is to get them out of our urban spaces, like Mr. Raccoon, a.k.a. Junio Costa, the number one no-kill humane raccoon trapper of the California Bay Area. Um, he told me that the animals are bold and curious and they eat pretty much everything. Raccoons move into our attics and our crawl spaces. They study us. They use their tiny, sensitive hands to manipulate locks and latches or pry out loose nails. They gnaw things open, and then they take running leaps also to knock things over. A raccoon will work on a problem, like lifting up a garage door or prying open a window or prying a vent cover off of a basement for hours until they figure it out. Sometimes they'll come back like night after night to work on the problem until they solve it. And once they do, they keep coming back. Mr. Raccoon told me that once he got a call every night from the same neighborhood for like two weeks because one ambitious raccoon figured out it, they were all tract homes. And so what would work to get into one of these tract houses would work in the entire neighborhood. So she just went house to house to house to house. <laughs> so raccoons are really the one of the only animal species to fare better um, as humans spread all over the planet. Not only that, but we are each problems for each other. They try to outsmart us, we try to outsmart them. It's unclear to me which of us is getting more intelligent faster. <laughs> All right, give it up for the back. Next up team. were Tracy Clayton and Jordan Mendoza. Back. Tracy Clayton and Jordan Mendoza. And uh, agreeing on an animal was a little harder than they expected. Okay, so here's the thing. <laughs> okay, so what, what did you We've end up decided doing? on a type of mammal. A type of mammal. The marsupial. Okay. Yes, oh, okay. we have the our marsupials. own individual marsupials. Tracy the marsupials kicked it off for Team Marsupial the... with this adorable yeah, little creature the called the quokka, yeah, which yeah, looks yeah, sort of like a chubby that. squirrel with wow. these teddy bear <laughs> eyes and little black gloves. Are you ready? Yeah. I think Ooh, we're I think okay. it's time. Literally, if, you're, if you have a hat, hold on to it. <laughs> if you're sitting in a chair, hold on to the, hold on to your butts. <laughs> Sam Jackson, I thought that the response would be, okay, so this, ladies and gentlemen, not to oversell it, is the most amazing animal facts you will ever hear in your life. Are you ready? Judges, are you ready? Macy, she's into it, okay. <clears throat> Here's why the quokka is the smartest animal. When... <laughs> Serious business. When approached by the... Pro Predator. <laughs> oh, man. We're going to get through this as a family, I swear. Okay, when approached by a predator, uh, a parent quokka, I don't know if it's the dad, the mom, the, you know, pronouns, I don't know their lives. Uh, approached by a predator, if a parent is with their child, they will throw the child at 
the predator. <laughs> to distract it while it runs away. So, I need to describe this image for the people who cannot see it. Where did you get this? So, at this point, Tracy had an illustration up on the screen of a mom tossing a baby into a basketball hoop. Uh, like, like she's at the free throw line. That's what quackas do, you know? And I think that this is really smart because you could make another one. You could make two or three. You know? If the both of y'all die because because you're that attached to your child, then what happens to your genetic line? It doesn't get passed on, right? This way, Quack was like, oh, shit, I like Emily, but I can make another, I can make Emily the second. Emily too. Pyrm, pyrm, and that's that. The Quacka goes on to live another day. The Quacka goes on to survive longer than anyone else will. Thank you. It's your turn if you still want to go. <laughs> it's very funny. I am scared. Uh, and Jordan decided to fight I, for I, I kind of yeah, a weird um, choice. So, uh, oh boy. So this is supposed to be a presentation about like what the smartest animal is. And a long time ago, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do koalas. Um, but then I, I, I looked it up, and apparently koalas are famously stupid. Wow. Um, here's how dumb koalas are. Um, their brains only take 2% of their body mass, which is apparently one of the smallest brain-to-body mass ratios of any mammal. Koalas' brains are also super smooth, which is bad because the more folds your brain has, the smarter you are. The human brain is like Marie Kondo, lots of folding. <laughs> Shout out to my condo heads out there, sparking joy. Uh, you know who you are. That guy. Honestly, that guy. I, I love her so much. Uh, guys, koalas are so dumb, they even sound dumb. Listen to this. Perhaps koalas aren't conventionally intelligent, just like how choosing koalas for this presentation wasn't conventionally intelligent. It was not. It was not. But I propose that we rethink intelligence, partly because I'm stuck with this animal, but mostly because I believe that this animal is in many ways smarter than us. Perhaps koalas are like how my mom describes me, smart in their own special way. <laughs> Um, let's compare koalas and humans to see who looks smart by comparison. This is a koala's daily schedule. Um, a koala sleeps 20 hours a day, while the remaining four hours they spend eating and mating. Incredible. Imagine only being awake for the amount of hours you need to eat and have sex. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of sex because I'm quote unquote awful at it, but boy do I love eating. The human schedule, on the other hand, is horrendous. We sleep on average 6.8 hours a night. We wake from our nightmares, then spend 10 hours reading emails and worrying, five hours on a conference call, and two hours eating dinner out of a big bowl while watching Billions and hoping to God that Paul Giamatti's voice can lull us to sleep again. In conclusion, koalas have optimized themselves for life's greatest gifts, eating, having sex for those who enjoy that kind of thing, and sleeping without the need to listen to Paul Giamatti's voice. And that's smart. Now who sounds stupid? Still koalas. <laughs> I, uh, I realize I clapped with everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know what? I am proud of myself. Do you think a koala would have done that? Clap with everybody else. Yeah, it's a real koala move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So oh we've heard from both the uh, pairs, raccoons and marsupials slash quokka and dumb slash smart koala. Yep. So after that, <laughs> let's proceed with you guys. It was what, time for yeah, the final yeah, judging. That was there's a lot, a lot, there's a lot to, to take, take in, in there. A lot yeah. of different arguments were put forward. Uh, I think I got to give this to the marsupial uh, du duet. Ooh. 
Ooh, all right, all right. All Who right. said what? <laughs> See me after the show. This was good. <laughs> Mr. Krolwich. Oh boy. <laughs> well, I was, I was, I was, I uh, was impressed by the boldness of the chicken of the. But before I the judges know. even had a chance to all weigh we're in, gonna, we're gonna. Oh, Objection. Shit. Objection. oh what is this? What's happening no. here? Laurel no, no, Braitman no. has walked yeah. a giant bone this across the stage and given it to Macy, the dog judge. A pretty serious incident of bribery went down. This is this like is, witness uh, tampering or something? <laughs> what do you call it? It's Ma- just bribery. Macy, don't you? Just Macy, bribery. Don't you do it. So, um, to keep things fair, we decided to just throw the whole thing over to the audience to vote with their applause uh, for their take on the smartest animal of the evening. So just to recap, the contenders were the crow, the slime mold, the sperm whale, the chicken, the raccoon, and the marsupials. And the winner, according to the audience, was... I think it's... I think it's pretty, pretty clear. clear who yeah. the winner is, I right? Think so it's, I think I asked to cue up a drum roll, but... I think yeah, we I... Drum roll, please. <laughs> ah, we're going to do it here. I think the winner of the contest, the smartest animal in the world, is... The sperm whale, the crown goes to Laurel Brayman. We had a we had a prize somewhere. I don't know who out here There's from our prize. team has it. There's a prize. Uh, we had we had planned to give a uh, give a gold <gasps> fish what? to the winner, and instead we have a red fish. We have a, a beta <laughs> fish. For, uh, for our winner, Laurel Braitman. One more time for Laurel Braitman winning our competition. She, she, she flew here from California with the, with the leg of an animal, and now she's flying back with it. So do we not fish. care that she attempted to bribe the judge? Did we just we just don't we just don't care about that, right? I, we're, I guess we're I guess we're letting I mean, the, the people have I mean, spoken. The judge, you know? I, I I don't mean, know. the judge didn't want it, so yeah, it didn't yeah, work. Like, okay. All right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay, that's that's our show, everyone. Thank you. To, thank you to, to everyone. Please give it up. Um, I have some thank yous. Thank you to our contributors. Dan Engber, Laurel Braitman, Tracy Clayton, and Jordan Mendoza. Take a bow. Uh, thanks to our judges, Jad Abumrad, Robert Krolich, Macy, and Bill Berloni, our assistant. Uh, thank you to the Radiolab staff who put this night together, Rachel Cusick, Nora Keller, Susie Lechtenberg, and the whole team here at the Green Space. Uh, tonight's show and all our reporting on the intelligence series that's starting to come out next Thursday has been supported by Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. We're very grateful to Simons. And additional support for Radiolab is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, enhancing public understanding of science and technology in the modern world. And most of all, thank you all for coming out. We can't do this without you. Uh, thank you for coming in the rain. Uh, and have a great night. Hi, this is Faye calling from New York, New York. Radio Lab is created by Jab Abenrod and is produced by Soren Wheeler. Dylan Keffey is our director of sound design. Susie Lettenberg is our executive producer. Our staff includes Simon Adler, Becca Bressler, Rachel Cusick, David Gebel, Bethel Habti, Tracy Hunt, Nora Keller, Matt Kielty, Robert Krolwich, Annie McEwen, Latif Nasser, Sarah Quarry, Ariane Wack, Pat Walters, and Molly Webster. With help from Shima Oli'i, W. Harry Fortuna, Ruth Samuel, Imani Leonard, Neil Danisha, Sarah Sandbach, and Melissa O'Donnell. Our fact checker is Michelle Harris.